somebody will just give people a minute just to join because it takes these Zoom videos a little bit of time to sync. So just bear with us whilst we give them a minute. Still got a few people coming in, so just uh, just hang tight one sec. If you could keep yourself on mute, that would be great. You should have arrived being on mute, but if you can just uh, double check that, that would be wonderful. Right, let's kick things off. Welcome to Visibility Uncovered. I'm Tammy Parler and I'm Chief Exec of the Women's Sport Trust. WST is a charity founded in 2012 and our work at the moment is, founded, is focused on three areas which together help to create a strong and dynamic women's sport ecosystem. Firstly, we're collecting and sharing data. This builds an evidence-based picture about the growth patterns and obstacles for women's sport and we use this as a catalyst to encourage further development within the industry. Secondly, we convene, educate and influence. So we try not to just to talk about issues. We seek to understand them and to identify the key actions that need to be taken. And thirdly, we run an elite athlete programme called Unlocked, which is all about understanding and increasing influencing power. Sport is one of the most important public arenas we have which means that sport has a responsibility to reflect the best version of society. Women's sport won't reach its potential if it's invisible. And over the past year, we've shared a significant amount of insight into visibility with the industry. And we're gonna keep doing that. In this next hour, Emma and Shalina from Futures, our research partner, will present our latest data. We've also been compiling some separate data. So board member Chris Hurst will pop in briefly mid presentation and share something relevant around digital performance. This will be followed by a panel discussion with colleagues from BBC Sport and Sky Sports. There is so much we can learn and so many opportunities for growth. I hope you find this hour really stimulating. Please keep yourself on mute. And if you have any questions, pop those into the chat and we'll try and get around to them. So without further ado, let me hand over to Emma and Shalina. Great. Thanks a lot, Tammy. Um, yeah, as Tammy says, I'm Emma, a senior analyst at Futures, um, and Shalina and I are going to be talking through um, this presentation on media visibility of women's sport in the UK. Um, I'm going to hand over to Shalina, who will uh, start off the presentation. Thanks, Emma. Um, nice to see you all. Um, my name's Shalina, um, as Tammy mentioned, and I'm a manager here at Futures. Um, so as Tammy said, we've been doing some research um, for the Women's Sport Trust over this year. Um, we specialize in a few different things at Futures and one of those is audience viewership. So this presentation here is gonna focus on that um, and specifically on linear TV trends. So throughout this presentation, um, we've got a few different bits that we'd like to go through with you all. So to start looking at some UK viewership trends, um, then we're gonna switch focus and look at some coverage and audiences by gender for some established mixed global events. So Wimbledon, the Olympics and the Paralympics. And then we're going to have a look at some new events that are striving for gender parity. And for this presentation, we're going to focus on the 100. Um, and then we'll look at the emergence of some standalone women's sport properties. And then again, for this presentation, we're going to focus on the Women's Super League. And then finally, we'll focus on some areas of growth. So to start, um, we've got some definitions throughout the slide um, called women's sports, mixed sport and men's sports. Um, and we just wanted to take a bit of time to explain that. So. Um, it's a bit of a limitation in the system where um, programs come in as different names and so based on I guess the, the ease that we can let out the sports um, is what these definitions are based on. So um, I guess the main things to note that for mixed sports that will include both men's and women's. So things like the Olympics, um, Wimbledon, um, other various um, athletics, things that can't be easily split out. Um, and I guess the main thing to note about women's sport and men's sport is that cricket has been split out separately. So when we reference the 100, for example, we'll be splitting out by women's and the men's tournament. So to start with um, some viewership trends, we've taken a look at women's and mixed sports um, over the last few years since 2012. So this is looking at cumulative viewing hours. Um, as you can see, there's kind of 
quite a few peaks um, that generally coincide with some of those big mixed events um, to the Olympics. I guess that the other thing to note here is obviously the scale at which um, mixed sports is quite a lot higher. Um, they obviously benefit from having quite a lot of coverage on free to air. I guess the thing to note here about women's sport is that peak in 2019, which coincided with the Women's World Cup in France. If we um, just look at women's sport a bit, um, they're kind of throughout um, as well. So again, it's kind of driven by these big tournaments that um, have free to air coverage. So the Women's World Cup and the Women's Euros. Um, and I guess the, the key throughout is that the 2019 peak from the World Cup has so far been um, the highest point of viewership for women's sport. When we look at, um, I guess, women's sport in comparison to Total TV, um, it's such a really positive story. So women's sport has kind of steadily been growing and obviously it's growing with these peaks. Um, obviously 2020 was a bit of a down year and 2021 is kind of continuing to go up. Um, but if we look at that in comparison to the Total TV, um, which has kind of been slowly but steadily declining since 2012, it's such a really positive story. So women's sport growth um, is happening despite Total TV um, going down and people watching a bit less TV. Um, when we look at women's sports split by just the pay TV broadcasters, um, it kind of tells a bit of a different story. Um, so there's sort of two big peaks that you can obviously see there. Um, and for pay TV, those peaks are driven by cricket tournaments. Um, so the Women's World Cup in 2017, and then obviously the emergence of the 100 this past summer. Um, the other positive around the pay TV women's sport audiences is that as you can see, they're kind of steadily growing. Um, obviously there's still some peaks and dips, but overall the trend is such that it's continuing to grow. If we again compare that to um, the general pay TV sport average, so um, all types of sports across these pay TV platforms, um, that's kind of generally flat. Obviously there was a dip um, in 2020 with COVID and a bit of a boost after that, but generally in 2021, it's kind of regressing back to the level it was at pre-COVID. Um, but generally, you can see that that trend there is pretty flat, whereas women's sport, again, is kind of growing despite um, the overall viewership on those pay TV platforms being flat. And then for the next few slides, we're going to focus um, a bit more on just this year. So this slide here is looking at the viewing hours for women's sport by month. Um, there's a couple of things we wanted to point out here. I guess, firstly, um, the football that like well, you can see is obviously much bigger in September. Um, and that's due to the start of the Women's Super League and the New Deal. Um, so it's showing games on linear BBC channels and then it's also on Sky Sports this year. Um, prior to the season, it was on BT Sport. Um, so you can see kind of the first five months of the year that football did make up quite a large proportion of um, the viewership for those months. But obviously in September, it's um, in absolute terms much higher. The other thing we wanted to point out was cricket. Um, so you can see obviously it's exploded in July and August. Um, driven by most of the 100, but also kind of the general cricket season. Um, and that's obviously making up a massive proportion of those audiences. And then looking at the peaks throughout the year um, for women's sports still, um, as you kind of predict, they're kind of mostly around the summer um, and around cricket. Um, particularly, you might have seen the news that the 100 Women's Open did particularly well and was one of the most watched um, women's matches, which we'll get onto a bit later. Um, but as you can see, it was very well watched and very high in the 100 did particularly well there. Um, and then the women's football show, which airs on BBC um, with that coverage on free to air always does particularly well. Um, if we switch to look at the mixed sports peak, um, it's actually quite a positive story for women's sports. So um, a lot of the peaks from this past year actually were driven by female athletes. So um, starting with the Grand National back in April, um, Rachel Blackmore won that as the first female jockey. Um, when we look at Wimbledon, obviously there's female athletes involved in that and obviously the, the relative success of Emma Raducani during that tournament um, drove some of those peaks. Um, again, the Olympics obviously has female athletes and this was the first tournament where there were more female athletes with Team GB than male athletes. Um, and then again, Paralympics obviously involves female athletes and Sarah Story doing particular, particularly well there. Um, and then of course the US Open Ladies Singles Finals, um, which Emma Raducani won, um, did particularly well um, just from that one final. Um, and then finally, um, in the last webinar, we presented this slide um, and predicted that women's sport was on track to surpass the peak that we saw in 2019. Um, we've since updated it and it's still on track to surpass that peak. Um, since we've um, done this presentation last, we've kind of obviously in the viewers that came from there. And so 
so far from January to September of this year, um, women's sport has reached 33 million people, um, which is great. Obviously, you can see that that's higher than the entirety of 2020 um, and even higher than some of the earlier years around here. Um, and then with the, the Women's Super League, obviously, there's only been um, about a month so far. Um, but as that continues and there's more games on BBC and Sky, um, we're predicting that that will do really well um, and kind of help boost the number above the 2019 peak. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Emma for this next section. Great. Thanks, Shalina. Um, so this next section, we're focusing a bit more on specific events. And this particular section is large global um, established events. So namely Wimbledon, the Olympics, Paralympics. And this first slide is looking at the proportion of the viewership for these large events split by male and female event slash matches. Um, and you can see that for both Wimbledon and the athletics and swimming at the Olympics and the Paralympics, there's a fairly even split between the, uh, the male events and the female events or matches for Wimbledon in terms of the amount of viewership for both. Um, so even parity um, across that. And then if we look at a slightly different medium of um, TV news and newspaper mentions, it's a similar story. So across both the Olympics and the Paralympics, um, the amount of uh, mentions in uh, free-to-air news coverage and press mentions um, was fairly similar across both male and female Team GB athletes um, at both the Olympics and the Paralympics. The Paralympics actually skewed slightly more towards the female share, uh, which in part was driven by Sarah's story, as um, Shalina has already mentioned. So another way we can look at this is um, the audio mentions of Team GB athletes um, during the live BBC coverage of the Olympics. Um, and the left-hand chart just looks at this split uh, day by day. And you can see there's a few fluctuations here for male and female athletes. Um, take, for example, the 6th of August, um, there's a really heavy skew for Team GB female athletes. Um, and this is this is all driven by kind of the events that took place that day. So say, for example, that, that 6th of August, it was the the women's Madison final where um, Team GB got gold um, and you also had the, the four by 100 meters women's relay where um, again Team GB got bronze. And then on the right hand side um, we, we've summarized that so actually to mention and it was widely reported at the time that there were for the first time ever there was more Team GB female athletes going to the Olympic than male and um, so that shares slightly higher or skews more towards female. Um, and then another level that we looked at is um, the total number of medals for both Team GB female and male athletes, which skews slightly more male. Um, and I guess the, the thinking there is that um, those athletes with more medal hopes or chances of um, being successful at the Olympics uh, were more likely to garner more attention and higher audiences. Um, but the final two circles at the bottom show that actually the, the total TV audio mentions for Team GB male athletes and female athletes were was still fairly similar um, at 47% for female. So clearly showing um, parity across the two. And then the other large global event we looked at was Wimbledon. Um, so this is looking at the match count of um, ladies singles matches and gentlemen singles matches at, the, at Wimbledon this year. Um, and actually what we found was that more, there were more um, ladies singles matches airing on BBC One than the men's singles. Um, which is a really positive story knowing that um, it's BBC One that drives the highest audiences compared to um, BBC Two, for example. Um, so to have more, more matches for, for the, women's, um, the women's games on that channel was a really positive story. And then finally on tennis, um, we just wanted to highlight the, the, the rising fame of Emma Raducanu in the last six months. Um, so this is just looking at the average audience or the average UK audience on Linear TV for, for Raducanu's matches this year, going from her first round match at Wimbledon not being not being televised at all as a relatively unknown player at the time. Um, and then as her success and her progression through Wimbledon um, took place, um, the audiences grew, going up to 5.3 million people watching her fourth round match at Wimbledon. And then an extension of that for the US Open final um, on Channel 4, which it was only really announced a few days before the match that it was going to going to air on Channel 4. Um, and that received 6 million um, average audience. So really shows the progression or the rising fame um, of Raducanu, which will no doubt continue to rise as her, um, as her career continues. 
So the next section is looking at new events um, and specifically here we're looking at the 100 and the relative success of the inaugural tournament this year. Um, so again, this is looking at the, the split of coverage hours for both the men's 100 and the women's 100. Um, and you can see that that first left hand, uh, the first bar on the left hand side is looking at the, the coverage split overall across the, the male and female tournament. And you can see it's, it's fairly even at 47% um, of the coverage hours across the tournament as a whole uh, was for the women's tournament. There's some variations when we look at just Sky and just BBC. Um, the BBC uh, female share is slightly lower, um, which uh, is largely driven by those, those fewer matches for the women's tournament to air uh, to simulcast on BBC. But all in all, the in terms of the, the volume of coverage, it, it was fairly even across the um, across both the men's and women's tournaments. But then if we look at if we look a bit deeper into that and um, we look at the the time slots so that both the men's and the women's tournaments had and also the channel um, that they add on um, there was some inequality so on the left hand side we're looking at the time of day that both the um, the men's and women's hundred aired and you can see that um, most of the women's matches aired in the afternoon compared to most of the men's airing in the evening um, the women also had some some morning matches on Saturday mornings at the weekend um, and we know from its general TV viewing trends that that, that evening slot is, is the prime time slot that generally will receive higher audiences. Um, and for that slot, there was only one uh, one occasion and one match that the women um, had that, which was for the for the opening game of the hundred, um, which we'll get onto. And we knew that um, we know that did really well. And then on the right hand side, we can look at the channel split for um, both the men's and women's tournaments. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the the women's tournament had slightly fewer um, matches to simulcast on BBC, um, but also some variations within the Sky Sports channels. Um, so you can see the the women's hundred had fewer matches to air on main event, which we know when simulcast on main event can um, largely drive drive audiences or bring um, new viewers to um, the broadcast. But equally, also fewer matches on Sky Sports cricket as well, um, and that was in part driven by the second half of the tournament clashing with um, England men's test series against India, which meant that those matches for the women that took place in the afternoon were, were moved to only air on Sky Sports Mix or Sky One only um, because of the, the test match airing on Sky Sports Cricket. Um, so that in turn, if we go to the next slide shows, we can see the impact of that. So this is a similar slide to the coverage that we I shared before, but this is looking at viewership and live viewing hours. And you can see that the split here is skewed slightly more male so 36% um, of all live audiences for the 100 were for um, the women's side of the tournament. Um, and again, there's some variations by channel. As I mentioned, Sky Sports Cricket and Sky Sports Main Event had fewer women's matches, which in turn has meant a smaller share for um, the women's side of things. But actually, if we look at BBC Two, and if we look at a side-by-side -side comparison of the first two games of the tournament, um, as I say, the women's, the first women's group match aired in the evening and then the next night was the men's um, first group match um, and the share if we just look at those was closer to um, closer to equal at around 44% to 56% so you, you can see that when the men's and women's tournament did get equal time slots and equal channels there was that parity And finally, on the 100, um, we just wanted to showcase the overall success of the tournament. Um, so this is looking at the top 10 highest um, average live UK audiences for women's cricket, including ICC tournaments, going back to 2009. And actually, what's happened is that six out of the top 10 most watched women's cricket matches on record have come from the inaugural Women's 100 this year. Um, which is really impressive knowing that that's competing with the likes of um, England women's matches simulcasting on BBC both this year and last year, and also the Women's World Cup final in 2017. Um, so this really helps to show that the strength of the 100 so far um, and how high interest has been around the, the first tournament. I'm going to switch back to Shalini now um, to talk about the next section of standalone women's sport properties. Great. Thanks, Emma. Um, so, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, this next section is going to focus on the new Women's Super League deal. Um, so, this slide here is looking at um, the games that have aired so far um, during the new season. 
So split across the channels, you can obviously see that the coverage is airing on quite a few different ones. Um, but there's kind of a few things to point out here. Um, I guess firstly, the games that are on BBC One are obviously um, doing particularly well, which we'd expect. Um, and then I guess the, the real positive is, um, I guess, the breadth of coverage. And if we look across um, the games aired on Sky Sports, they're often simulcast on quite a few different channels. Um, and I guess the positive there is that when those games are getting that coverage and it's kind of exciting teams. So, for example, that Man City Spurs game, um, they got 290,000. Um, that's pretty comparable to what some of the games are getting on BBC Two. Um, so there's a real, um, I guess, area to grow there. And the, um, there's definitely people that are interested in kind of can rival some of those those free to air um, numbers. I guess the other big positive from this season is when we compare it to the average from BT Sports. So looking at the 2020-21 season, um, the average game got 39,000 viewers on BT Sports. Um, so as you can see, that's obviously um, lower than all of these games have gotten so far. Um, so it's definitely been, I guess, a, a very strong start to the new deal. Um, obviously this will continue on and there's gonna be many more games that are airing um, not only on BBC, but obviously across Sky as well. Um, so we're expecting to kind of see that continue, but so far it's been a very strong start um, for this property and, and performing much better than it has in previous years. Um, I guess to put that into some context, I guess one of the, the main aims of getting coverage on free to air and um, having that ability is receiving new viewers. So people that um, potentially didn't have access to BT Sport or Sky Sport, um, but can now watch because it's on BBC. So. This slide here is, um, I guess, looking to put some evidence behind that. So looking at how many more new viewers um, the Women's Super League has gotten so far this season due to the coverage. So if we look at the left-hand side um, and taking it on a three-minute reach basis, um, so looking at the Super League on BT Sport from the 2017 season to last season, um, it reached 2.4 million viewers. Um, when we look at the reach so far for this season, so that's just kind of September of the New Deal, um, on BBC and Sky Sports, there's 8.9 million viewers that it's reached so far. Um, when we look at the overlap of those two, um, there's an overlap of 1 million. So um, a million of those viewers have had watched previously on BT Sport and then have also watched this season on either Sky or BBC. Um, when we look at that in the total, that translates to 89% of the viewers from this season um, hadn't watched any Women's Super League coverage previously. Um, so obviously that's a huge number that have been um, able to watch some coverage of the Women's Super League that hadn't before. Um, and then obviously that group is representing quite a growth target of, we'd obviously want them to become repeat viewers and continue to watch. Um, but yeah, just kind of highlighting um, how many more new viewers have actually come into the, to the coverage so far. And obviously this is only um, based on the first month of the season. So um, it's a great start and we're expecting that um, positive start to continue on throughout the season. Um, and then the next section, we're going to talk about areas for future growth. Um, there's a few different bits um, we want to speak about, but I guess we we firstly spoke briefly about habit and kind of converting those new viewers into regular viewers to build fans. Um, so we wanted to look at how um, that's building across the Women's Super League. So this slide here is looking at the percent of viewers, um, again, based on a three minute reach, um, who've watched the Women's Super League more than once, um, so had watched more than one game. So obviously a couple of things to point out here, um, but firstly, the, the growth trend. So if we look back at the 2017 season, um, it's obviously fairly low. Um, and if we look at last season, that creeped up to just under a third. Um, so that growth there in just a few seasons is great. Um, I guess the real positive is when we look at this season so far. So we're already higher than what we had for the 2020-21 season at 33%. Um, and again, that's obviously just the season so far. So there's obviously a lot more um, matches to come where people can watch more than once. Um, so that kind of driving that habit viewing um, kind of quite a key area for growth and uh, so far in the Women's Super League that's going well. I guess to put it in some perspective um, against other women's sport properties and men's sport properties, um, so far cricket is performing the best in that sense. So um, their percentage of viewers that have watched the property on more than one occasion is the highest, um, whether it's the 100 or England women's cricket. Um, as we said, obviously the Super League's doing well so far and that's next after that. Um, I guess the the comparison point to men's is kind of shows the area for growth there. So even for cricket, while it's obviously performing the best women's sport and it's not too far off, the men's 100 or 55%, um, there's obviously still a bit of room to grow there. Um, I think the main difference is obviously that 87% for the Premier League for men's sport. Um, 
obviously we know that that's quite, um, I guess, a club focused property um, and quite um, strong fandom. So there's obviously, I guess it's, it's unsurprising that that number is so high for the Premier League, um, but it shows that there's obviously a lot of room for the Women's Super League to, to reach those heights. Um, and then I guess on that note, um, we had a look at kind of how can we help drive habit and that repeat viewing. And there's, I guess, a few different aspects that we wanted to cover off. Um, so digital platforms, scheduling, and then pay TV free to air partnerships. Um, so to start with, we're gonna focus on digital platforms um, and I'm hand back to Chris at Women's Sport Trust just to discuss this next section. Thank you, Shalina and morning, everybody. Um, Although a lot of our research has focused on broadcast, we believe that digital is absolutely key to the growth of women's sports. So we've been doing various different bits of research around digital, and one of which we'll share today. So we've been looking on a daily basis during the summer at the top 10 stories on both the BBC Sport and Sky Sports website at a particular time of day and seeing what percentage of that coverage of the top 10 stories is um, devoted to women's sport. Um, and the results here again are positive. So 31.7% of BBC Sports top 10 stories um, in July to September 2021 um, were around women's sport, and that compares to 22.5% in the same period in 2019. On Sky Sports, um, similarly, uh, a positive growth story. So in the same period, 12.5% um, of Sky's top 10 stories um, were around women's sport, um, which compares to 6.2% in the same period in 2019. Um, but interestingly, in September, when Sky were covering not only Emma Raducanu, but also um, properties that were live on Sky Sports, such as the Women's Super League and the England New Zealand Women's Series, um, their coverage actually rose to 18.2% um, of, of their top 10 stories being dedicated to women's sport. So growth area um, there and still plenty of potential um, for growth. Um, but um, yeah, some, some encouraging stories and we'll, we'll continue to share more digital data points in future presentations as well. Um, now back to Shalina. Thanks, Chris. Um, so the next section um, on helping drive habit is scheduling. So um, the first bit we wanted to highlight was the Women's Super League. Um, and so obviously now the Super League's on BBC and Sky Sports, and there's a few different windows across that, um, which we've highlighted in the top section of this slide. Um, as you can see, obviously the audiences fluctuate um, with BBC being the highest. Um, I guess the point that we really wanted to highlight on this slide was how much the audiences fluctuate on Sky Sports. So as you can see, based on the timing there, um, the audiences do change um, and kind of quite drastically. Um, and I guess the point that we wanted to highlight there was that those lower ones, um, so the Saturday 11.30, Sunday 12.30 and then Sunday 3 p.m. Um, are particularly low because they clash with Premier League. Um, so the bottom half of the slide, we've listed out um, the Premier League time slots, um, the channels that those air on and the likelihood of a clash. Um, so that Friday 8 p.m. Um, fixture for the Premier League isn't a regular one. Um, there are some Friday night games, but so far there's only been two this season. So the likelihood of the clash is um, lower. Whereas when we look at, um, the Saturday 12.30, which is the BT Sport time slot for the Premier League, um, that airs every week that the Premier League is on. And so you can see that that has a real impact on the Saturday 11.30 Women's Super League game. Um, it does impact the BBC game as well at Saturday at 1.30, but obviously BBC um, being a free-to-air channel can kind of withstand that competition much better than Sky Sports can. Um, and then again, if we look at Sunday, um, obviously Super Sunday on Sky Sports for the Premier League is um, kind of a big part of their their time slot and their windows and that coverage there is always on. So you've got the game at 2 p.m. and the game at 4.30 p.m. Um, and you can see that the two women's Super League slots that impact that um, are kind of much lower um, than just even a few hours later on that Sunday 6.45 p.m. slot. Um, last season, the Premier League did have that Sunday 7 p.m. slot, but now with fans back in stadium, that slot isn't happening anymore. So there's zero percent chance of a clash there. And you can see that 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 time slot is actually getting the highest average audience on Sky. Um, so obviously there's, um, I guess, a, a big fluctuation in the audiences based on when it does clash with the Premier League. And um, I guess in order to kind of maximize the audiences and, um, and keep viewers retained, um, kind of trying to have those games on when they might not clash with Premier League, um, is there's a clear benefit to that. Um, I guess to, to switch to another property, um, I'm gonna hand back to Emma to talk about the scheduling impact on the 100. Great. Thanks, Shalina. Um, yeah, so switching back to the 100 and um, something that we, we flagged earlier with the, the variations in, in 
time slot and um, the channels that it's airing on. This is kind of just breaking that down and quantifying it in terms of the impact it had on the audiences. Um, so firstly, you can see that um, the average audience overall for the Women's 100 this year was 219,000 uh, viewers. Um, and if we break that down or separate that into those that were just airing on Sky Sports and those that aired on both Sky Sports and BBC Two, um, you can first see the clear benefit of matches to air on free to air with a big boost up to 628,000 um, people watching when it's simulcast on, on a free to air channel. But then if we go one step further, um, we can look at, I guess, the impact of clashes and the times. So starting with the left hand side of the, of the tree, um, you can look at the matches on BBC Two when they were either starting in the evening or the final. Um, the audiences were much higher than when they were in afternoon start. So again, going back to when we looked at um, the different time slots and knowing that that prime time evening slot is going to drive more audiences than um, the afternoon slot. And then on the other side, looking at Sky Sports, um, you can see that when the women's matches didn't clash with any other men's hundred or any England men's matches, um, as I mentioned, that the England test series against England men's test series that um, started halfway through the tournament against India had it had a clear impact um, when it did clash with women's matches. Um, and you can see that impact here. Um, no clash would receive 160,000 viewers compared to 59K um, with that clash. So the final um, tenet of how do you help drive habit is those um, pay TV free to air partnerships. Um, and again, for this, we we focused on the 100 and women's cricket specifically. So this is a similar slide to um, Shalina, what Shalina shared earlier on, on the Women's Super League, looking at how many more viewers have been bought into women's cricket as a result of their free to air coverage and BBC specifically. Um, so if we focus on the, the large grey circle and, and the reach of women's cricket on BBC this year. So overall, 8.3 million people watched um, three minutes or more of women's cricket on BBC in the 2021 summer. And that's across both England women um, and the women's hundred. And of that 8.3 million people, 75% of them didn't watch any of the coverage on Sky across, again, England women and the hundred. Um, and that equates to 6.2 million new viewers bought in um, off the back of this free-to-air coverage. Um, so a huge number and really showing the power of free-to-air in bringing um, more people to a sport and women's cricket specifically in this example. Um, and as Shalina mentioned with the Super League, I guess the, the hope is that those viewers become more regular and um, become viewers on, on Sky Sports um, watching regular women's cricket off the back of this initial stint on free-to-air. So the final section that we want to talk about is um, female audiences for various different sports properties. Um, so again, focusing on the 100 specifically first, um, this is looking at the proportion of viewers that were female um, for various different domestic cricket properties. Um, and you can see that the both the men's and women's 100 was successful in attracting a higher proportion of female viewers than existing domestic cricket leagues. Um, both this year with uh, men's domestic cricket leagues like the Blast, the County Championship and the Royal London Club Cup. Um, but also if we go back to the last time there was a domestic women's cricket league airing on TV, uh, it was the Kia Super League back in, in 2019. Um, and you can see that the Women's 100 has managed to receive a higher female share than that tournament. Um, so clearly done its job um, when we're comparing it to existing cricket leagues and um, being able to attract a higher a female audience share. But then if we put those numbers into a bit more context and look at it against other uh, other women's sport properties and other men's sport properties, but most importantly, um, mixed event properties, you can see that it's these the big, large global established mixed events like Wimbledon, the Olympics and Paralympics that gain the highest female share at over 50% um, compared to um, standalone women's sport and men's sport properties that are, are more at the 32% mark. Um, so a clear boost for these big mixed events um, for female viewers. One thing we do know from these standalone properties, um, or a clear trend we've seen so far, is that when these properties have that combination of pay TV and free-to-air coverage, um, it's the free-to-air coverage that is able to receive a higher female um, percentage than the pay TV. Um, and that's been a trend across um, all of the ones you can see here, um, with the exception of 
um, England women's cricket, which is which is equal. Um, but a clear trend that when it's on free to air, that we know generally across all bro broadcasts um, receives a higher female audience share. Um, there's that trend. Um, it's still not quite up there with the the fifty percent um, plus for the large mixed events like Wimbledon Olympics and the Paralympics. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if that. Um, that trend continues or that share increases as um, properties like the 100 or the new rights deal with the Super League um, become more established. So just summing all of that up with some final three takeaways. Um, so I guess as Shalina alluded to earlier on in, in the presentation, 2021 is still on track to be a record year for women's sport UK TV audiences. Um, and in part that's driven by some of the events we've spoken to through later on in, in the slides, um, like the 100 and the new broadcast deal for the Women's Super League. But it's the established global events like Wimbledon, the Olympics and the Paralympics that um, are clearly achieving gender parity in both their coverage um, and their viewership and with mediums like TV news and newspaper mentions as well. And it's also these events that, as I shared just before, receive the highest rate of female audiences. However, these new mixed events like the 100 and standalone women's properties like the Women's Super League are clearly driving interest um, and bringing women's sport to new fans. Um, but there is still work to do in facilitating that viewer habit that we, that we mentioned um, and increasing the female audience share for these new properties um, as they continue to grow. And that's it from us at Futures. Um, I'm gonna hand back to Tammy now, um, who will start the discussion on everything we've just gone through. Brilliant, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Shalina. Now I'm gonna do one of those really complicated things and try and spotlight people as I, um, as I introduce them. So we'll, we'll see if that goal goes horribly wrong. Thank you once again, Emma, Shalina. Futures have been absolutely fantastic. Brilliant to work with. I really appreciate you uh, presenting those stats today. Um, so I'd like to now welcome three experts to, to discuss those, um, the data we've shared. Firstly, um, and spotlight, day. well, it is working, brilliant. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Chris Hurst. Uh, Chris is a sports consultant, and I'm thrilled to say he's also a trustee of the Women's Sport Trust. Um, secondly, I would like to welcome Vix Cotton. Vix is ex executive producer for live streaming at BBC Sport. And then, oh, I can't wish you gone. Joe, where are you? Oh, there you are. Um, lastly, I'd like to, mention, to, to welcome Joe Osborne, who's executive producer at Sky Sports. Um, welcome all. It's quite unusual for us to have both BBC and Sky on the same panel. And I think that shows so much around um, the positivity around women's sport and how all, we all collectively want to see it grow. So I'm really grateful that uh, the three of you are here today. Um, there's loads of information with that presentation to take in. Chris, can I come to you first and ask you what would be your key takeaways? I mean, for me, uh, I think actually it's it, it brilliant, obviously, to be able to share kind of this data with with a wider group and be able to actually track with 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 data how visible women's sport is becoming. Like on the back of a really challenging pandemic year, the fact that women's sport is on for record audiences in in twenty twenty one, I think, is is hugely encouraging. But we shouldn't forget that we're still at the early stages of the visibility journey, and there's still lots of work to be done. I think um, the research that uh, Shalina and Emma presented showed that there's a real opportunity around trying to build habit around women's sport. And that I think is a, should be a real focus um, for everyone working in the industry. I, I don't think media alone can solve this. I, I, I know a lot of our research has, has focused on the media, but I think actually the whole sports ecosystem have a role to play in, in both growing the visibility of women's sport, but also building habit. So that, that for me, I think is a, a key area of focus that the women's sports industry needs to, to focus on moving forward. But what opportunity there is, the fact that there are gonna hopefully be record audiences in 2021, when you look at the sports calendar in 2022, and you have the women's Euros, um, World Cups in cricket, rugby union, rugby league, and then these um, 
domestic properties, um, which again is a, a real big kind of changing point for, for me. Like previously, big audiences have, have really been driven in women's sport by standalone international events. The fact it's now domestic properties driving this, I think provides great encouragement for 2022 that there are going to be unprecedented audiences kind of moving forward built on the back of international events and, and, and domestic events. And what an opportunity for brands to go and invest in this. Absolutely. Um, the gender parity of coverage on TV for events like Tokyo and Wimbledon shows that gender parity can be achieved around major events. Vix, can I come to you? How does the BBC approach giving equal exposure to male and female athletes across its platforms, not just for those traditional sports um, events, but also when it comes to things like men's and women's football? We don't deal with, um, everything sits with a central team. So we don't deal with sports as being male sport or female sport, it's sport. So our WSL contract will sit in with our, our football team and, and everything is seen in the round. So you, the, it's, a, it's a completely kind of, the a really great overview of seeing how, how we represent sport. Um, I think when we started something like the 100, a huge amount of work went into the website and making sure that that was equal. A huge amount of work goes into the language that we use. Um, and I think there's a real awareness now. Um, you know, we work with really talented people who really care about sport and they take this very, very seriously. Um, you look at something like the Olympics, it's easier when you have um, a team that's made up of a, the same amount of male and female athletes, more female athletes this time. Um, but the research and awareness that goes into preparing those events, I think, really helps. And I think we have actually feel, it does feel like we've hit that tipping point now that it's not men's sport. It's not women's sport. We deal with sports. Um, there was a great afternoon at Wimbledon, I remember, and I, I wrote it in my diary that um, on BBC One and BBC Two, we had two top class women's matches playing out at the same time with an all female summary team and commentary team on both sides. Um, we're getting to a point as well that we have women making the decisions. So for our Olympics coverage, we had two women editing there. Um, you know, got to call out Dominique Middleton, her work on the, the Women's 100 and the preparation that she put in there as well. So I think all, all in all, we have kind of reached that tipping point now where we have great input, we have great research, and we're not seeing things as men's sport and women's sport. It's been seen as sport as, as our output. Interesting that one point about um, the the impact of having more women behind the scenes as well. And on um, um, the um, you mentioned uh, the hundred because it wasn't just those historical events that we've we've seen in, in in the data achieving gender parity. Joe, can I come to you? Um, what can we learn from the success of the hundred in in both driving coverage and also female viewership? As I suppose, what what are the key learnings that Sky's taking forward for the future? We've, I think we've learned a lot. I think we're learning a lot all the time. I totally agree with Vix as well on everything she's just said around um, having that that sort of circle of decision making as well. And the fact that, you, you know, you can't drive to inclusion without having the right people sort of talking to our audiences. I think I think first and foremost, what The 100 has done brilliantly is proves that if you start with a new format, you can view everything through that lens of gender parity and take away some of that historical um, male you know I think cricket we can all agree was historically unapologetically male we look at women's football it's coming from a point where it's not historically had the support that, that the men's game has had so actually when you look at it as a new format through a gender parity lens you can market Sophia Dunkley and um, and Sarah Taylor up next to Adil Rashid and Ben Stokes you can you know we showed all all the women's games live why wouldn't we show all the women's games live next to all the men's games live so that it gives you that that starting point, but it also proves that that audience is there as, as those slides have just shown. So actually it then is a good mark, a good template for other governing bodies to say, we know that audience is there. Um, I think the second thing um, we learned from it is around um, finding our metrics for success. So mm -hmm. we talk a lot about whether the men's, whether we treat women's sport just like we treat men's sport, but actually I think there's a lot we can learn. There's a lot we can take through, just as Vic said, around taking it seriously, giving it an equal platform, making sure we're giving it the respect it deserves. But actually, we celebrate the differences as well. We celebrate what's great about women's sport. And that might not exactly be the same as it is in the men's game, you know, from 
you know, how many sixes are hitting the hundred to, you know, what we talk about on the pitch for the WSL, those, those differences won't always be exactly the same. So I think it's really important that we include batter, not batsman, all those things, but we, but we also celebrate those differences. Um, and I think thirdly, around your point on, on female viewership, I think that's a really interesting one for me. And I can see already in the chat, there's, there's a lot of talk about it because actually we talk about women's sport and we talk about female viewership. And I think there's a massive overlap there, but they're not the same thing. And I think what we've tried to do on the 100, what we've tried to do on the WSL as well is say, right, we're going to talk to our existing audience, which is on Sky, historically a little bit more male. So, or a lot more male in, in some cases. So actually we say, we think women's sport is great. We think women's football, we think WSL is great. We think the 100 is great across the board. Watch it. We think you'll like it. But also then try and make sure our storytelling on our other platforms is increasing as per those slides at the end, so that we are talking in lots of different ways to lots of different people and being as inclusive as possible. I, I, I have no hand-eye coordination. I cannot play sport. I have not come at it through participation, but I watched it a lot as a, as a kid and I attended with my family. So that's how I approach sport. I'll be different from the next person. I'm probably different from and Tammy and Vix and everyone on this call and how I come to sport. So let's try and bring people in in every single way we can um, so I think I think I've talked a lot there, but those were a lot of our learnings. But actually, I think that's learning is the important thing is that we're ready to adapt and learn. And I think, you know, working closely with the ECB on the 100 will go to next year. And I think there'll be changes because actually we've seen a lot. We've learned a lot and, and we'll keep learning. And I think we need to do that, especially with women's sport, where we don't always have the insight that we have in some of our other sports. I totally hear you when you say that learning there seems to so we go out and talk to all different sorts of people and the, there really feels like there's this appetite to learn and to understand and to grow that is really really quite exciting also your point about metrics for success and I'm reminded of um uh is it the space space between space beyond Lisa Parfit's organization and um, recently released some really interesting um research into um, fandom for women's sport that, that is starting to really unpick this whole idea of um, of audience and so forth so if you haven't if those of uh, on the call if you haven't uh, read that I really do encourage you to uh, to have a look at that um, often a lot of uh, focus is put on how the media should increase the visibility of sport but um, as Chris has already mentioned at WST we know it's about the whole ecosystem working together. It's not one person's responsibility or one organization's responsibility to, to sort this out, so to speak. Um, can I ask both of you, Vix and, and, and Joe, what partnerships and collaborations have worked particularly well for you when promoting women's sport? So that idea of, of working with others to push things forward. We were laughing about this the other day in that probably 2019, the, the Netball World Cup, um, that was where Joe and I first worked together. And that was a really great example of broadcasters working together. You know, Sky have got a great history with netball. But, you know, we, we could bring a new audience to that as well. And working with England Netball at the time, it felt like a really great collaborative, creative way of, of working together. Um, so I think there are kind of avenues like that, a bit interesting. Obviously, the, the hundreds carrying that forwards as well. I mean, I don't know what you think, Joe. I totally agree. I think netball's a really a really good example. Actually, we've got, as you say, we've we've, we've had a fifteen year partnership with England Netball, and I think what's been really brilliant about it for us is that we work with them, and yeah, as we did with the BBC at the Netball World Cup, we work with them to work out what their goals are, and what you know, it's about sort of all working together to say where is this sport in its growth journey? Because let's be honest, all our different sports, women's sports and men's sports are at a different stage in their growth journey. They won't all have the same approach. So where are they in their growth journey? What do they want? Well, right now they want reach. So if fans can't get into venues in 2021, let's stream every single game live on YouTube, which is what we did and saw brilliant numbers. And I think as Vix has referenced before, we get a hugely higher um, female viewership for that 75% women are watching those streams on YouTube which is for us massively different from our it's basically the opposite to our linear channel so that's been brilliant working with them across that but also coming back to those same points what do they want they want the quality of the coverage raised so that we're treating it seriously we've got the best experts 
we know we've got good camera coverage. We're showing, we're showcasing their sport the best that we can. Um, they want to feed that back into participation, which the investment then does. So actually, it's this big circle of working together that I think um, England Netball has been a really good example of for us. And I think talking about <coughs> partnerships, sponsors are starting to see that too. So Vitality have been long term partners, but you see what Barclays have done with the, WS, the WSL. You know, if you want a partner with football, you need to be partnered with women's football as well as men's football. But also the access that we get from netball and from lots of our women's sports. Vix, I don't know if you'd agree. The access is is so great that I think sponsors are really seeing the opportunity there as well. It's not just the right thing to do. Women's sport pre presents us opportunities to tell those stories better that don't always come with longer, more established sponsorship deals in, in men's sport. And it also gives you that, that access to that opportunity audience. We talk about a female audience and we're still seeing, you know, sometimes it's more of a male audience to female sports still. So what is that huge opportunity audience of bringing women there as well? Um, I'm particularly interested to see what the Rugby League World Cup does next year, because that's really innovative scheduling in giving the women's competition um, a place to shine and bringing that together. So I think that would be really interesting to see how the women's competition comes to the fore during that one next year. I think that's a really good example of a governing body looking at the sport that it has and really giving it the best opportunity to shine and grow on a big stage. There's, I've been watching the, the chat as well and an interesting comment around, <clears throat> excuse me, interesting comment around marketing spend. I think the whole um, idea of, of how money works within the system is a, is a really fascinating one. The research here has been focused quite, obviously quite a lot on broadcast and as, as an organisation we're going to be continuing to um, collect this data on visibility, share it, stimulate the sector. Chris, I've got two questions for you. Um, firstly, why is that important? But secondly, um, we, you know, we chat all the time. You know, I'm fascinated by how fandom is built, how money works within the system. Um, what do you see or what do you anticipate will be the next areas the industry really needs to, to get to grips with? So taking the first question, um, I think it's great that we've now got a baseline of data of what, of where we are at, at the current moment in time. And, and I'd probably like to refer people to the Closing the Visibility Gap report that we re released earlier in the year, which is available on the Women's Sports Trust website, where we provided recommendations to different stakeholders in the industry of what you can do yourselves. And actually, I'd encourage you be working for a brand or for a league or for a club to actually do some similar research to the ones we've done here looking at your own digital channels, for example, like what percentage of posts are you putting out around women's versus kind of men's sports? How are they performing? Are audiences reacting? Because I think by having a greater understanding of, of where we are at the moment and where we want to get to, I, I think we can share those learnings. And the, there very much seems to be a spirit of collaboration and, and knowledge sharing around women's sport that, that it's really welcome. I noticed in, in the chat, Bruna um, yes. put, put a question in around what, what can social channels do better? Do better? Um, I think aside from looking at the kind of the current state of play of, of where you are on your social channels and, and, and looking at performance, I think there's a really interesting question um, for, for those working in the industry to consider. I, I, I hear quite often um, sports teams and, and, and leagues saying, oh, I might not post much about my women's content because it'll damage my short-term social media metrics and then my content won't show in the algorithm. Like, I, I think there's a real opportunity to actually think beyond short-term performance and think longer term in terms of what the, the size of the prize is if we get this right and actually we build fandom around women's sport. Um, so, so that for me would be something I think both the social platforms and, and those working on digital channels have a, a responsibility to do and, and how can social channels play a role in that journey by surfacing um, content around women's sport to, to people who might have an interest, for example, in, in, in football already, but might not follow many women's football accounts around big events like the Women's Euros next summer. How can we use those big moments to encourage a whole new generation of, of, of fans and, and different audience segments and then keep them interested once it um, is outside the major event and we get into kind of the domestic league competition. Um, and in terms of your second question, Tammy, um, and, and areas of 
kind of future interest. We've spoken about it a little bit already, but habit feels so important. Um, and so thinking about how we can drive different forms of emotional connections with our audiences, with women's sport, be that storytelling, be that through interactivity, be that through product innovations. Um, an example that I, I have referenced quite a bit in the last month is I love what Sky Sports have done to their app where they put the, the men's Premier League team table next to the women's Super League table side by side. It's giving that prominence um, and credibility to, to women's football and, and helping audiences get to women's sports content in the same way BBC Sports push notifications do that in driving you to watch live sport and also kind of discover the, the stories around um, the leading athletes. So, yeah, I, I think thinking about what we can all do to drive habit is absolutely crucial for me. Well, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of our panellists for joining us today. I'm aware that we're, we're just uh, about to run out of time. Um, we're going to be continuing to pull data uh, look forward to welcoming you back to another update in, in, in the new year. And also, if you want to hear more from the panellists, tune in tomorrow. There's going to be an episode on the Unofficial Partners podcast, which features all of them discussing things um, or to continuing the discussion. Um, so huge thanks. Please look at our visibility research on our website. The slides that you saw and a copy of this presentation will be on our website shortly. So um, thank you very much. And uh, let's grow women's sport.